Thank you, sir, very much. I'm thrilled to, uh, to be here tonight and so uh, to be able to talk about a, uh, you know, something that, I, that, that is near and dear to me and that's supplier diversity and to, to really bring it home in terms of uh, from a professional and a personal level, I'm gonna tie that in. You know, for, for me to be here today um, is very important for different reasons. Number one, it's always important for, for us to educate as much as we can in terms of what supplier diversity is. But to me, what's even more important is to talk about why is it important and why is it personal. So, um, this is my book, and I'm not here for a shameless plug, um, because I talk a lot about supplier diversity in the book. And so, I came out with this book in 2014. And so again, the name of the title is Transform National. It's a word that we made up, transforming nations one soul at a time. And the subtitle is Journey of a Bastard. You heard me right, Journey of a Bastard. The reason why that's important is because I didn't meet my dad until I was almost 30. So I grew up on the west side of Chicago in the uh, housing projects called Rockwell Gardens. And if anybody that's, anybody from Chicago, by the way, in here? Are you familiar with Rockwell Gardens? So you know that uh, for me to even be on this stage right now is, is a blessing. So what we learned was how to dodge bullets, you know, how to uh, try to stay out of trouble. And there are times when I was staying out of trouble and still trouble came to me. And so somebody convinced me in uh, 2013 to write this book. And the part about it was, the best part about it for me was that it allowed me to be able to really uh, let out a lot of things that I had closed the door on for a long time. And to me, it was therapeutic. And so what I want to tell all of you, first of all, every single person here has a story to tell. I don't care if you came from the suburbs, if you, you know, just grew up like the Brady Bunch. You know, I used to watch the Brady Bunch and say, oh, people didn't live like that. They actually had grass, <laughs> they had trees. No, they didn't live like that. I didn't believe that that was possible. But regardless of, where, of how you came up and where you came from, everybody has a story to tell. And so if you don't decide to do a, uh, a published book, still put it on the journal because if you have kids they need to understand the legacy that you are leaving behind they need to understand the house that they live in you know uh, the sacrifices that you had to make and even if you didn't have to make sacrifices i guarantee you that there's somebody in here right now that's hurting there's somebody in here right now that's probably not telling their story completely to the person next to them and so when you think about uh, telling your story that's important because somebody out there needs to hear that story so that they can get the confidence to go out there and do the things that they need to do and so being able to write this book gave me the impetus to be able to push forward and to tell my story and so I'm gonna go to the next slide and show you a picture and so tell me who this gentleman is who's that that's George Jefferson from the Jeffersons. You're probably wondering, what does George Jefferson have to do with my presentation? So again, when I was growing up in that neighborhood, the neighborhood was all, all African American. However, the business owners did not look like me. And so for me, mentally, I used to tell myself that wasn't possible. There's no way that I can own a company. You know, and you don't even think about it in terms of your psyche becomes, your, your psyche takes over and tells you that you can't own a company. And so I didn't realize it was possible until I saw the TV show, The Jeffersons. It took television to be able to explain to me that I can actually own a company and convince me. Because unfortunately in the neighborhood, the businessmen and businesswomen were drug dealers. You know, some of the smartest people I've ever met, but they were drug dealers. And so I did not realize that it was possible to actually own a company. And so when I t saw this TV show, and there's still times when it's on TV, I have to stop and pause and watch it because that gave me the motivation for me to be able to go out there and try to get to where I am today, and that's owning a company. So when we talk about supplier diversity, again, just knowing, knowing that from a personal perspective, I had my impetus already. And that impetus was to go out there and to own my own company. However, when I came across this initiative, Supplier Diversity, and first of all, for me to be here at ISM's event is fantastic because my background is purchasing. And so having that purchasing background gave me actually that exposure to Supplier Diversity. So I had first heard about it when I worked for Abbott Laboratories. And I was invited to come to a conference and I was just wearing my hand out because I was writing down everything that um, I needed to know in terms of Supplier Diversity. 
And so supplier diversity, if you don't know, is it's a program that was really established by President Nixon in 1969 with an executive order. And the purpose of it was at that time was to influence organizations to buy products and services from minority businesses. Now, it has since developed into something else, and I'll talk about that. But what you see right here in this triangle are the different groups that are a part of supplier diversity. So whether you're a woman-owned company, and so I was happy to see the WeBank affiliate here, whether you're a minority-owned company, again, happy to see DFW MSDC here, um, whether you're a veteran-owned company, LGBT-owned company, disabled-owned business, um, all of those fit within the supplier diversity mold, even if you're just a small business, because you have government contracts out there that are looking for just small businesses. And so the next one is going to the, really the history of supplier diversity. I always like this slide because it really gives you a reason why um, it's here. It also lets you see that it's not something that just happened. You know, this is something that the, I told you about the executive order, but the origins of supplier diversity started way back when. And so when the uh, Great Depression was in place, Congress actually stepped up to help both large and small businesses. But then all of a sudden you started getting into the war efforts and the large companies were able to support the efforts, but the small companies couldn't. And so that's when the government stepped up to provide the SBA and, and other measures to be able to help those small businesses. And all of a sudden you get into the civil rights era. And that's when it shifted to helping minority-owned companies and then women-owned companies. And all of a sudden, you started having diversity advocates that were out there supporting the, uh, those types of groups that were out there. And so the beautiful part about this slide right here is what you see on the bottom. And so it started out really as a mandate. It was something that you had to do. Again, it was an executive order, so it was something that you had to do. And then it became more of a corporate responsibility. You know, it's the right thing to do. Uh, we're a great corporate citizen um, by doing this and having a program in place. But then it transitioned into a, a, uh, an economic and business imperative. And that's why I love it today. Because now, when we talk about supplier diversity, we're talking about helping those communities like the one that I grew up in. And so when we go out and we try to help these small, diverse businesses, one of the things that we're doing is going out and, and really putting the imp impetus and emphasis on creating jobs out in those communities. Because if they're not creating jobs, then what's the point of existing? You need to go out there and establish these programs so that you can go out there and influence the jobs that are out there. You think about those little kids. Think about me as a little kid when I was growing up. And if I had an early ex exposure to a, uh, a minority-owned company, think about you know, just the, the impact that I could have had at such an earlier age. You know, and you think about other little kids that are out there that need that exposure. And so again, you know, I'll put the onus back on diverse businesses, going back into those communities and showing those kids who you are, showing those kids that it is possible. And so when you talk about the way it is now with an economic imperative, it is up to corporations like yours to go back to those diverse businesses and influence them to add jobs to those communities. You know, one of the things that I would love to do is to go into prisons, go into prisons and teach the prisoners about how to become an entrepreneur the right way. You know, you've got, think about the, uh, the drug dealers that are out there, at least those are, that were in my neighborhood, some of the smartest minds that you could see. You know, some of the, the uh, they, they, they had a great memory. They, all, they understood customer service. <laughs> they understood sales, marketing, security, logistics. But they just didn't understand how to bring it all together. And so from that perspective, I would love to be a driving force to help them to take that knowledge that they have, the acumen that they have, because we know when they get out, they're not going to be hired by the large companies. You know, we know that. And so it's those diverse businesses that are hiring individuals like that. And so that's why it's very important, especially when you talk about uh, when the elections come, when they start talking about small businesses. The reason why they do that is because they understand that it's one thing if the large companies start collapsing, but if the small businesses collapse, 60 to 80 percent of all new jobs come from small businesses. So you can imagine the impact on the economy if that starts to happen. So the six C's, and again, this is something that, um, that I created, and, and really the reason why it was created was because there was really nothing out there in terms of uh, establishing the business case for supplier diversity. So when somebody asks, why are we doing this? You know, it just, again, it's not just the right thing to do or you know, um, and even just an economic imperative. You need to be able to articulate it. And so, you know, the six C's is something that um, I came up with regardless of what industry you're in. So it's agnostic. And so at the top, you see clients. 
So a lot of organizations establish supplier diversity programs because of their clients. Either their clients have a government contract or their clients are in underserved communities or, or just their clients may have a, a strong supplier diversity program. So they're making their suppliers turn around and help support their initiatives. And if you have clients that are out there, I'm sure some of your clients are starting to push back on you. Or you can go to your suppliers and have the suppliers support your supplier diversity program. The next one that we have here is competition. So a lot of RFPs, if not the majority of RFPs that are out there right now, have supplier diversity language. And so I've always, any company that I've worked with or was at, I always wanted to make sure that if you were to compare our supplier diversity efforts to any of our competitors, we better come out on top. Because in a lot of situations, that, that actually is the deciding factor and it becomes your differentiator. And so again, if you're being uh, compared to somebody else that does not have a program or their program is not as strong, that's the differentiator, is, is your supplier diversity effort. Another element of uh, competition is the more you have a, if, if you have a supplier diversity program, you're increasing your supplier base. And so the more suppliers that you have, now all of a sudden you don't have that supplier that kicks their feet up. And I'm sure we all have those suppliers that, you know, we've been doing business with them for 20 years and, you know, they, they, they got a little, little, little happy. You know, they kicked their feet up and got a little comfortable. And so they're probably not as aggressive with their pricing as much. And so when you introduce diverse suppliers, now all of a sudden they're looking at it differently now. They got to sharpen those pencils a little sharper. They got to be more innovative. Uh, in terms of their approach and the products and service that they, they, services that they provide. So then when you look at the bottom compliance, compliance is an issue where if you have a government contract, you're actually mandated to do business with diverse suppliers. But what I'm also starting to see is companies that are starting to uh, incorporate that into their contracts with their suppliers and basically penalizing them financially if they don't meet a certain requirement or threshold for diverse suppliers. I never like to lead with compliance because what you don't want to happen is you just wipe your hand, you know, once you meet that goal and then you move on. But it is an element and it is something that it kind of goes back to your clients. Your clients may have a government contract, so you have to understand that and understanding their needs for supplier diversity. On the bottom is something that's near and dear to me and that's community. And so when you talk about job creation, again, Supplier diversity could be the number one factor in terms of revitalizing a community that's out there. When you think about those jobs that could be added as a result of doing business with those diverse suppliers, and really when you drive home the fact that we're going to count on you to add those jobs to the community, that becomes important and, and that's how the uh, communities are impacted. Another way that communities are impacted is when, you d when you're working with a client and they're in underserved communities, it's also nice to be able to source from those particular communities. And not only source, but then also educate the, uh, the residents within those communities about being an entrepreneur. Some of them may not even understand what, what being an entrepreneur is. And we have some of the strongest companies out here from a development perspective. You may have great marketing teams. You may have great, um, you know, from a finance accounting perspective. You know, you may have a strong legal team. You have resources that are in place to be able to use to go out and educate those, uh, those diverse communities that are out there. Customization. So anytime you do business with diverse suppliers, you're able to customize solutions. They're able to customize solutions. So if you went to a large company and you asked to change the color of a product that you, that you currently get, it's not that they couldn't do it, but it's just that it would take them a long time because of the bureaucracy. But you, when you're working with diverse suppliers, they have more flexibility to be able to customize those solutions. So that's another way of being able to get the products and services that you need. And then lastly is cost. And so when you look at diverse suppliers, one of the, the, uh, the biggest stigmas that are out there is that it adds cost to the solution. It does not. Diverse suppliers don't have a thousand sales reps that are out there pounding the pavement. And so, and so as long as they are flexible within the, uh, the cost structures that they have, and you use, the, again, the knowledge that your companies have to go out there and develop and educate the diverse businesses on how they can cut some of the costs out of their solutions, they can come back and they can save you a lot of money. And so when we develop solutions, we're looking at those opportunities, looking at those situations where diverse suppliers are, are bringing value to the table by saving money for corporations. So it's called RISE, R-I-S-E. So RISE is really the strategy. Anytime I go into an organization and try to uh, establish a supplier diversity program, I'm always using RISE as a strategy for every year. And so what RISE is, is really four pillars in terms of um, how do you establish goals every single year to support your supplier diversity program. So the R in RISE is revenue, revenue generation. And this is something that you don't really see in a lot of supplier diversity programs. A lot of the focus is on always buying products and services from diverse businesses. But we don't talk about generating revenue. 
And so at RLC, that's what we do. We try to find out what is it that is your strength? What is your core competence at your company? And how do we establish a program that can generate revenues through that? And understanding what your assets are so that we can, again, go out and either uh, buy, uh, create products and services that we can sell to the general marketplace or find ways that you can partner with diverse firms to be able to sell to the diversity community. The I in RISE is infrastructure. And so what this means is you're really changing the culture in a company. And so when I talked earlier about going into communities, going in prisons, that's how you change a culture within a company. That's how you get companies to see why this is very important to us. This is not just us creating a program to be able to buy products and services from businesses. This is us trying to change the mentality of folks even coming in the door, in and out of the doors of the company. And when you, you want to talk about from a recruitment perspective, really when you have an infrastructure where you can pluck anybody from a company and ask, you know, what is it about our supplier diversity program? And it can tell you two or three things about your program without having to look you up. That's when you know that you've changed the culture in the company. And so again, when we go into these companies, that's what we're looking for as, as far as how can we change the culture in that particular company so that they can go out there and have employees that, that you pluck from the street and they can at least tell you two or three bullet points about supplier diversity. The S in, supplier, in, in the uh, rise is spend. So spend is always going to be the main metric for uh, supplier diversity, but it's not one that I always like to lead with because to me, an increase in spend with diverse suppliers is always a byproduct of a successful supplier diversity program. And so, yeah, it's a main metric, but it's not something that you want to lead with because, again, it goes back to my previous point in terms of uh, compliance, where you want to get, you know, you may have a goal of, of uh, 10%, you get to 10%, and what happens? You know, you wipe your hands and say, we met our goal. So the byproduct of that is spend. So the success of building all of those other pillars is spend. Now the last one that's on this slide is something that's near and dear to me, and that's education. And so that's education in many ways. It's educating, again, like I talked about ad nauseum, educating the communities that are out there. It's educating internally the employees, you know, educating them about your supplier diversity efforts and why is it important. It's also educating your suppliers. You may have some suppliers that are not diverse and may not understand about supplier diversity. So it's educating them on why is it important to you. So when you have CEOs that emphasize the importance of their program, that's when all of a sudden you make a big effort and dent in terms of your supplier diversity program. Our mission at RLC is, is exactly what you see right here. We, we maximize the value of diversity. And so we look at it in different ways. You don't see supplier diversity. You see something that is general and focused because what we want to do is to go in and understand what that culture is. So a little bit about the profile. Sorry, I got to put a commercial in there because I got to let you know where I'm coming from. But um, we were founded in 2011 and a beautiful part about it. And, and first off, I want to say thank you to my team that's here right now at the table. We've got Adrienne Norwood right here, who thank you very much for, uh, for doing the, uh, the slides. We got Mr. Jesse Crawford. So Jesse pushed me to be an entrepreneur and then he left me and went to the airport. <laughs> so I'm happy that the brother is back here and, and, and side by side. We also have Mr. Dwayne Webb. So Dwayne owned his, uh, his own staffing company and so they all provide things that, uh, elements that are needed. You know, so if you ever saw the Avengers, that's what I feel like we have. So we all bring something that's to the table that I didn't have. And so if you're a business owner, uh, the, the, the worst thing that you can do is to think that you have all of the answers. The worst thing that you can do is to not turn around and try to build a strong team so that, you know, it may be a situation where I may be sick or I'm just not available. I should be able to pluck any of those teammates and they should be able to give a similar presentation. And so that's how this is constructed in terms of the team. So experience that you can see up there, over 80 years of corporate experience, over 52 years of supplier diversity experience. And so when you think about that, again, it's going in there and really establishing programs that are from different facets. So whether it's advertising, entertainment, media, healthcare, sports, um, telecom, telecommunications, government. Uh, so a lot of that is all integrated within this. There's various divisions and one division I want to point out, the gentleman is not here, and that's sports and entertainment. And the reason why I want to tie that into this is, so what we do is we help professional athletes and entertainers transition from what they do into business ownership. So when I was growing up, the only way that you can get out of the ghetto was either through entertainment, and so I used to, I used to be in a group that imitated the group New Edition. Um, I would do some performances, but my knees are kind of hurting a little bit, so I, I don't know if I can really do it for you tonight. Um, <laughs> by the way, the Bobby Brown story is coming out uh, next month, so please watch it. So 
But a lot of these athletes, I'm sure you have, has anybody ever seen the, uh, the 30 for 30 series called Broke about the athletes? These athletes are going uh, broke after about three to five years after they retire from the game. And a lot of these athletes come again from the neighborhood that I grew up in, those types of neighborhoods. And so our impetus is to go out there and help these athletes. Number one, educate them about being a business owner. Also trying to match them up to opportunities that are conducive to whatever their passion is. And so if they're in fishing, why are they going out there and establishing like a, a dry cleaner? You're not George Jefferson, <laughs> you know? So establish something that's within your particular area of, uh, of, of uh, interest. And so, you know, being able to do that gives us a chance to be able to help these athletes because, again, the athletes, that's why I love LeBron James. Again, I'm from Chicago, and, you know, you automatically think that Jordan was my, my number one idol, and it was actually Dr. J. So Dr. J is one of the classiest individuals that, um, that, that walks the face of this earth, and hopefully one of these days I'll get a chance to meet him. But I have ultimate respect for what LeBron James is doing out there. I may not like him as a basketball player because as a Bull fan, he eliminated my team a lot of times. <laughs> I guess it's payback for what Jordan did to the Cleveland uh, Cavaliers. But what he's doing right now is what a lot of these athletes are doing out there today. And that's trying to make a difference. And so when I talk about those kids that are in those inner cities and looking up to these athletes and, and, and aspire to be those athletes, now what they're doing is they're aspiring in different ways. Number one, they, they aspire from a professional sports perspective. Obviously, they want to have those skills and things of that nature. But thanks to LeBron and Magic Johnson and all of those guys, now they aspire to be businessmen and business women. And so you have a lot of these athletes coming into the league wanting to start businesses. Whereas when I was growing up, these athletes didn't get into business until after they retired. And again, what did they go into? Franchises, and not putting it down, but franchises, cleaners, you know, car washes, things of that nature. Now these athletes are starting to get into venture capital. They're starting to get into uh, technology and things like that. And so it's a huge trend that's coming up. And so the beautiful part about it is it's introducing innovation to the industry. And so when you guys are out there trying to uh, uh, find companies that can sell the products and services that you need, you're now being introduced to innovation that's coming from these accelerators and, and, and a lot of these groups that these athletes are a part of. I want to close this by just giving you again my personal journey um, in terms of where I am today. You know, being a kid on the west side of Chicago, I got exposed to a lot that I should not have been exposed to. You know, I'd come home at the age of, you know, six, and I would see on one side of my apartment two sisters snorting cocaine. And on the other side of the apartment, one brother who led a gang in Chicago wiping off his sawed off shotgun and didn't have a father in the home. Easily, I could have been a victim. You know, and there were times, there was one time we, uh, my, my cousin and I dropped somebody off at a, at a uh, neighborhood um, uh, building, and we got shot at. So I was about six inches from getting shot. And so that's what that book is about. That book is about that journey. We all have journeys that we've been through. You know, some of us may have been in abusive marriages. Some of us may have, uh, you know, been exposed to things that our parents had done to us, um, unfortunate, you know, sexual abuse and things of that nature. Um, but what I'll tell you right now is that you being here today means that you're a survivor. You know, I've got a friend that's in, uh, in Arizona, and he grew up in the same neighborhood that I grew up in. But career-wise, he didn't think that he was uh, successful. And I had to tell him, Walter, wait a minute, you, you survived just like I did, and you moved your family from Chicago to California to Arizona to try to find a better life for them. So you are a success. You're a better success to, to me than, than I think that I am to you. And so we have those. And so one of the things I always love to talk about is, you know, um, Bundinis. And, and I, I'm, I'm pointing at the cameraman because he, he's, he heard the story before. Does anybody know who Bundini is? When I say the word Bundini, he's the trainer for Muhammad Ali. And you're probably wondering why am I bringing that and why am I going to close with Bundini? So when you think about Muhammad Ali, everybody knows who Muhammad Ali is, right? And you always heard the float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Guess who made that up? It was Bundini. When you watch the movie Ali, it was Jamie Foxx. That was the character that he played in the movie was Bundini Brown. The reason why I bring that up is you may know Muhammad Ali. You may understand that Muhammad Ali did all of the things that he did, the accomplishments that he had, but it was Bundini Brown that was pushing him. It was Bundini Brown that was literally in his corner. We all have Bundinis in our lives. My Bundini was my mom before she passed away in 2015. She pushed me to be the person that I am today. And so I love hearing the stories from diverse business owners when they tell you about why they created their companies. And again, it's because they had those Bundinis in their lives. It may have been their children, it may have been their spouse, you know, it may have been a neighbor down the street, it may have been an aunt, it may have been an uncle. 
but we all have bundinis. And so what I challenge each and every one of you guys, when I get off, and ladies, when I get off of the stage, is be somebody's bundini. And also recognize the bundinis that were in your life and appreciate them. Let them know how much you appreciate everything that you did for them. And so when, I, when we help diverse suppliers, we want to be the bundinis for them. We want to be the ones that when they turn around and they say we were able to get a, a, a hundred million dollar contract because of the work that we did with you in the beginning, that's the success that I want to have. It's not about anything else. It's about that job creation. It's about the success that you bring into those organizations because you were that Bundini for somebody else. Thank you. Appreciate it.